want to learn how to manage your own investments? Are you ready to stop paying investment management fees and start building wealth? The DIY Investing Podcast is dedicated to providing you with the knowledge, skills, and resources you need to be a better investor. Learn how to make investments through the use of fundamental analysis, mental models, and business management insights. Now, here's your host, value investing expert, Trey Henninger. Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing Podcast. My name is Trey Henniger and I'm your host. This week I have a special guest on the show, David Keller. David is the Chief Market Strategist at StockCharts.com and President of Sierra Alpha Research LLC. David is a Chartered Market Technician and focuses on issues of behavioral finance. David, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Trey. It's a pleasure to, to join you. So David, I'm just interested first in hearing how you would describe your process of doing investment research. Sure. Um, so my background is in technical research, and, and I, I started in the industry in, in 2000 uh, with Bloomberg in New York, um, really in an entry level type of uh, type of role working with uh, with uh, our users. But as I learned about investing and was and was taught all the different parts of the uh, of the Bloomberg product technical analysis immediately clicked for me. And so um, I would say the reason why I studied actually music and psychology uh, in college. So uh, the psychology made sense. When I, when I found out there was a toolkit that would try to help you get inside the heads of the other investors and you know appreciating decision-making and their mental state and what was driving their uh, emotional decision-making, uh, I, I was hooked. I, I thought that made a ton of sense because that, that's what I'd studied in, uh, in, in psychology. And then it's funny, music has a very mathematical side to it. Uh, there's a creative side, but a very mathematical side. So I think the statistical side of technical analysis was was of interest to me as well because of uh, because of the reason. So somehow my my degrees in music and psychology uniquely uh, prepared me for a career as a technical analyst. And from then, I, I've enjoyed uh, sort of immersing myself in that that side of the business. And when I, you know, for me, technical analysis was a way of quantifying investor behavior, but as I progressed through my uh, career, I was up at Fidelity uh, in Boston for about eight and a half years as a director of research and worked with a lot of the portfolio managers there, helping them um, you know, come up with buy and sell decisions for their portfolios based on the charts. And I found that a lot of our discussions you know, were about stock picking, but it was also about decision making because we would address situations where a portfolio manager would be uh, you know, selling too early or you know, not really following the trends or having, uh, you know, some sort of uh, behavioral biases that were getting in the way, clearly getting in the way of their decisions. And technical analysis was a was a toolkit to help address some of those uh, some of those challenges. And so, for me, focusing on the behavior that drove the decisions uh, was a was a natural uh, extension to that. So, for me, I've loved focusing on uh, decision making, and I've used the the lenses of behavioral finance in terms of why we make decisions and then technical analysis as a way of bringing more discipline to your decision making. And that's kind of how I, uh, how I think of investing. So in terms of that, then, I mean, I don't have a lot of experience in technical analysis, so you have to forgive some of the questions, but, um, <laughs> sure. yeah, yeah. so when you're talking about quantifying the investor behavior, I mean, I think on the surface for myself historically, and certainly some investors, they'll see the technical analysis. It's of course showing investor behavior as the price changes and that sort of thing. But what are you really trying to get out of the technical analysis for actually leading to your investment decision? I mean, what is your goal from doing the technical analysis um, because I think some people take it maybe a little too far and think they can predict the future for a very long time with that. But I'm just trying to understand what are you trying to get out of your technical analysis? And then how do you apply that to, oh, I'm going to buy stock X versus stock Y? Sure. So I would say, you know, my experience mostly has been working with institutional investors and, and how they incorporate technical analysis into their process. And then uh, with my own firm, Sierra Alpha Research, it was with financial advisors primarily about how they make asset allocation decisions, how they, you know, construct their, the investment side of their, their business. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the data, if you look at what 
um, what prices do. If you look at what stocks do over different time frames in the short term, if your investment horizon is a couple days to a couple weeks, then in general, you're best uh, betting on mean reversion because on that time frame, stocks that are weaker tend to uh, revert higher and stocks that are stronger tend to revert backwards. That's just a normal sort of fluctuation of the of supply and demand, right? As it fluctuates around a valuation. On the intermediate time frame, which is more a couple months to a couple years, um, you're better off being a trend follower because that's where the persistence of trends tends to uh, tends to proliferate. So stocks tending, you know, stocks performing well over six months tend to perform well over the next couple of months. And the same stocks that are underperforming over that time frame tend to underperform. So those first two time frames, that there's a reason why most quantitative models at an institution are going to include a momentum factor. And it's usually a very simplistic thing like 12 minus one, 12 month returns minus one month return. And what you're doing is you're, you're betting on the combination of those first two phenomena that I mentioned. You're betting on a one year trend being a signal of a strong stock that you probably want to own. Um, and the short, you know, the weaker short term, the weaker one month tells you it's pulled back a little bit uh, and it, you're getting in at a, at a better entry point. And that factor, that momentum factor has been proven to be persistent for decades. And even as people have become more familiar with the momentum factor, it still works and, and it has worked. And that's, you know, momentum and value are the two persistent factors that have uh, that have been shown to outperform uh, over many, many cycles. Interestingly, if you go further out, so if you go a couple years plus, you're getting into more of a mean reverting type of thing. This gets more into the business cycle and sectors and themes coming in and out in favor. And that's why, you know, a mutual fund that tends to do poorly over a three to five year period, in, instead of wanting to sell that, you probably want to buy that because that means the theme is so out of favor, it's probably going to come back and uh, and revert higher. So for me, technical analysis, and, and, and again, you alluded to the fact that there are, there are many different things under the technical analysis umbrella, some that are way more esoteric than others. I've met, spent my career working with institutional investors and working with non-technical analysts, working with fundamentally oriented investors. And so it's all about how it fits into the, into the overall process. So for me, it's about betting on those statistical anomalies that are persistent in stock prices and combining it in a meaningful way with the fundamental process. So I always tell people there are plenty of bad times to buy good stocks. So a lot of times a company looks good, good management team, good product line, good catalyst for growth, but the stock price goes down. We've all seen that happen. And so there's a disconnect at times between the fundamental story and the price of the asset, the supply and demand. And all we're trying to do with technical analysis is address that supply and demand driven by emotions, driven by fear and greed, trying to quantify that and relate it back to the fundamental stories. So is the idea then that as a fundamental investor, um, a value investor, you're going to first do, you know, like if you're working with someone, you're working with an institutional investor, they're going to first work on saying which companies they want to buy, and then you're going to help them find entry points. Is that right? Yeah. So two places that I find it fits in the process, and it's it's either or both, the, the very beginning of the process or at the end of the process. And you're kind of hinting at that at the latter, which is putting it at the end of the process, which is absolutely the the primary where I would think of it. So you know, you look at uh, uh, all the stocks that you might be interested in, you boil it down to 20 stocks that you think are good fundamental stories. You like the the structure, you like the valuation, you like the prospects for growth. These are the ones you want to do. Then you look at the charts and the charts are the way that you will filter that group of 20 actionable stories down to five actionable charts where the timing is actually at a point where it looks it looks good. Because again, there are plenty of times when you have a really good company, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good investment right now. And so the charts are going to tell you what the trend is and where the momentum is and who's doing the buying or selling and, and, and what the sentiment is behind that stock. And if you combine them, then hopefully it gives you a trigger. That's what would trigger the buy or sell decision uh, based on, on the charts, based on the companies that you like. I would also say, though, it, it does have value at the beginning of the process more for screening. Because as a fundamental analyst, you can only go so deep into a small handful of companies. You don't have enough time to go through all the stocks that you could potentially buy or sell at any point. So using charts, using price as a way to screen for potential opportunities is a good way to just see out of all the 10,000 plus stocks I could buy or sell right now, which are the ones that are starting to really emerge as leadership? Which are the ones that are really struggling? Which are the one, and the way I, I often do that is which are stocks making new 
13 week price highs or new 13 week price lows. And that will tell you when something might have been out of favor and it's starting to come back into favor or the opposite, something that's been working that is starting to roll over a little bit. And by capturing it early on in the rotation, you may want to look at those companies and see, is there enough in the story here that maybe it's something emerging that I would want to want to buy in on. So I, I found people can use them in a, in a very helpful way on, on both sides of the process. So let's dive into, I guess, how we make this actionable. So mm. as a fundamental investor, if you're trying to harness the, the use of the charts, the use of technical analysis, are you trying to always buy when there's positive momentum? Is, is the goal to eliminate um, I guess holding those. Um, I mean, the, the, the term "fallen knife" is overused, but 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 basically <laughs> trying to avoid um, stocks that are currently on a negative downtrend. I mean, because a lot of fundamental investors that don't use technical analysis, and I know I include myself in this, have yeah. gotten caught where you buy a company and then before you know it, it's down twenty percent because it attracted you because it was down. So is the idea mm, yeah. to buy them on the momentum? I mean, what's, what is the actionable target here um, without we going yeah. into like the, how to do, you know, a full, you know, 10 hour lecture, but like, what are they looking <laughs> for to make this work? You know? Absolutely. So, so I would say, you know, asking what the right, I mean, so the, the, the short answer is there are plenty of ways to, to try and do it. And I find that, Charts are most helpful when they are in line with how you're trying to win the game. So, you know, same like if I asked you, what what are the fundamental characteristics of a good stock? You might answer that question very differently if you're looking for value or if you're looking for growth, right? You, you'd have a very different yeah. definition of what makes a good company right now because you're looking for different things, right? And as a value investor, you might be happy unwinding a position after it's appreciated it's time because the valuation looks very rich. Whereas a growth investor might be really interesting in something in buying something that's strong and riding it for the next five years of strength because they're looking for emerging growth. So I, I think the the answer depends on your 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 approach, how you're trying to win the game. And if we we sort of simplistically think of growth versus value, as a value investor, so you're you're by definition looking for things that are pretty beaten down and the price is going to reflect that. So the, the companies that look attractive to you, the charts are going to look pretty beaten down probably because their stocks are undervalued. And that means the P in the PE has, has shrunk or the E, the earnings have grown uh, significantly. It's probably more the shrinkage in the P that's going to, in the, in the, the price part, that's going to put it, put it down at the, uh, at the bottom. Um, and so uh, what we would do technically is I like to draw a sort of simplistic chart. Here's what a chart might look like. And you, um, you know, tell me where you think you might be interested in it. And as a value investor, you probably are interested in things that are going down, um, you know, and, and, are, and are selling off. Or you may be a little more conservative. You're looking for something that's actually starting to bottom out a little bit, looking for, um, you know, something that has started to show some signs of accumulation. And I think that's where technical analysis would start to filter. Um, you're, you're not going to want to look for sort of the proverbial, for proverbial falling knife. Because, uh, you know, stocks that have gone down, you know, often will go down much further. And we always say, uh, you know, never confuse the bottom of the page with support. Um, you know, the price can go much further down than it has up until this moment. But looking for some sign of accumulation, some sort of bottoming pattern, some sort of indication of a, a rotation from distribution by institutions to more accumulation. And there are a series of, of technical tools that would help us capture that could be a way of filtering out some of those uh, some of those stocks. So and you, I would also say that as a, um, you know, in, in terms of risk management, that's where technical analysis can be super effective because just as you mentioned, you buy a stock and it goes down 20%. The goal of technical analysis is, uh, is to prevent small losses from becoming large losses. And the way you do that is by having the chart trigger you when something is getting worse, when something's starting to underperform. Now, if you're more growth oriented, there's a completely separate, separate uh, set of tools that we would that we would employ looking for long-term uptrends and short-term weakness within long-term uptrends. And that's how most growth-oriented institutional investors use technical analysis, looking for strong uptrends and shorter you know, pullbacks within an uptrend. It shows you that there's been some profit taking, there's been some distribution, but overall the long-term trend is still in place. And that's a really good time to buy 
long-term growth stories because you're getting in at a better entry point and you're buying in on a long-term trend at a more affordable thing. So it's more of the growth at a reasonable price sort of approach. So I want to come back to the growth, but but mm -hmm. first I want to dig in. You mentioned specifically that there's you know, there's certain tools of technical analysis you might use to mm -hmm. identify that kind of bottoming pattern or where you might want to enter as a value investor. Can you name some of those tools so that investors and listeners that are interested can go and do additional research on how to apply those? Sure. So there are a couple, and, and I would say the technical toolkit is, is pretty diverse, but generally you can bucket um, indicators that we're going to talk about in, in two camps. There's sort of leading indicators, uh, which are trying to anticipate a reversal in the trend. And then there are more lagging indicators, things that are more trend following, more uh, confirming that a trend has changed. And there's a lot of money to be made uh, trend following. It's just because you're missing the bottom and missing the top. You're betting on trends occurring, on prices moving in trends, which the last couple of years in, in the equity markets have certainly shown that stocks can move in trends. And, and something like semiconductors can just do well over multiple periods uh, with pretty good success. So there's value there. Um, so if you're thinking of looking at, at bottoms, I would say two buckets. In terms of leading indicators, things that would try to anticipate trend exhaustion, anticipate an exhaustion of sellers and entry point of buyers. Um, there's a series of indicators called the DeMarc indicators um, created by Tom DeMarc years ago. And, and the one in particular uh, called sequential is meant to uh, you know, count price bars to identify when a trend is most likely exhausted. And it's a series of an entry point and a stop loss that's built into it. But a lot of people use their own uh, sort of stop loss approach. Um, and it's a way of anticipating when something has reversed. Um, I found institutional investors don't tend to be super excited about that because you don't want to buy something and have it just completely go to zero. So the other category, more trend following, can be very, very interesting. And uh, the indicator that comes to mind is called RSI, which is the Relative Strength Index, which is a measure of price momentum. So it sort of looks at how does a stock normally trade? What is the price movement on an average week? And then what is the price movement right now? And is it at an extreme? Is it uh, in, in an extended move? Has it moved too far too quickly? And uh, I'm, I'm obviously muddying, I'm, I'm skipping the details here, but it essentially identifies when something has become overextended. And so what would happen is it would tell you when something's sold off to the point where going back historically, it's usually where the stock would tend to bottom out. And then you have a confirmation, you have a, a signal when it's no longer overextended, when it's no longer going down so much that you have to stay away from it. It signals some sort of uh, upside reversal. So what a lot of more technically oriented investors use a combination of the two. The leading indicator sort of puts it on your watch list. The lagging indicator, the trend following confirmation is what validates it and gives you the trigger to, to build a position on the name. And the RSI is the lagging indicator? That's right. Yeah, so when we think about <clears throat> the use of kind of identified bottoms, and you mentioned that a lot of institutional investors don't necessarily like using um, some of those parts because they're worried about something going to zero or something like that. Mm. And we think about how you have a lot of institutional investors focusing on the growth and the very long-term uptrends. What I'm interested in knowing is do you think that the institutional investors are choosing that way of investing because it is inherently always better or like do they know something that retail investors don't know do they have resources that retail investors don't know or are they investing in a certain way because there's restrictions around how they have to invest and mm. those restrictions force them to invest in a certain way that works well for their circumstances but perhaps you without those circumstances you might do something else does that make sense yeah, that's a really thoughtful question. Actually, I, I love I, I love how you explain that, and and uh, and it's a great it's a great it's a great question. Um, so I, I would say it's a little of both. I would say that um, you know trend following the reason why a lot of I would say institution institutional money managers, especially like an equity portfolio manager, is going to employ more of a trend following approach. I would argue, yes, part of that plays to not necessarily the restrictions, but um, their incentive, right? So their their goal is to outperform. So by definition. <clears throat> excuse me, you need to be in stocks that are outperforming. So if you want to outperform the S&P 500, you need to own stocks that are outperforming the S&P 500, or by definition, you're not going to do it. So having a technical discipline that's going to help you identify stocks that are outperforming, that's going to have a lot of value. And you, <clears throat> excuse me, at some point 
are going to need to be in those stocks that are doing well, or else you're never going to be able to outperform. I would say it definitely comes into play with some larger benchmark names, something like the FANG stocks, Facebook, Alphabet, Apple. Um, <clears throat> when these stocks have been in an extended uptrend, there's such a pressure as an institutional money manager to own those names, because if you don't own a big benchmark name that's doing well, you're in a huge performance hole that it's almost impossible to dig out of. And the S&P 500 is, the most, is a difficult benchmark to outperform anyways, but, but not being into those big names like an Apple as it's, set, as it's hitting new highs, you have to be there. So the benefit of technical analysis is identifying which stocks are really working so that you can rotate there as much as possible. And I think a lot of money managers uh, have to do that just because they have to justify to clients what stocks they're, uh, they're owning or they're not. Now, whether or not that causes those tools to be more successful because people are following them. So is it a <clears throat> chicken or the egg scenario? Do, do people follow them because they work or do people do, do it as a work because people follow them? It's really hard to answer. But what I, what I would tell you is, again, that, that the first introduction I was explaining about price dynamics and how the short-term time frame is more mean reversion than intermediate time frame is, is trend following, that, that's been demonstrated. Um, you know, academic research has, has shown that momentum factor exists and here's what it is. And so I, I, think, I think you have to, you know, you have to uh, be aware of the trends. Uh, and I think that's where, where institutions are at a point when they, they need to be justifying what they're doing and active management is, is under fire at times, I would, I would be using any tool you could to help you outperform. And so I think people are finding that sort of that momentum approach uh, has worked. And so it's something you need to, you know, you want to be aware of for sure. So I think this idea about performance and the incentives that institutions are under <clears throat> is really interesting because when they're incentivized to outperform, it causes them to take actions that investors that don't need to outperform might not take. So like they have to be in the FANG stocks because they're going up and they're outperforming, but that, that also means they're going to be in the FANG stocks when it turns. I mean, that's right. you can't, I mean, as a market, everyone can't get out of the fang stocks if they turn now maybe, maybe they never turn <laughs> and we'll, right. i mean but like if the the process of you trying to get out if you're a big black rock institution you're you're going to cause the downtrend so i think that's the part that i'm showing i mean do you think that this idea of always needing out performance leads to some people making bad decisions not that that's a bad idea i mean because that's underlies the whole industry but do you think people make bad decisions simply because they're being forced to or else they get fired yeah boy that's a that's a that's a lot that you could go with that question um so uh, you know I, yes i i would say i i'm never a fan of when behavior is incented in a way that doesn't you know that if you if you didn't have that incentive that you wouldn't make those same decisions that that, that feels a little off I would say, though, that active management has been changing and, and certainly continues to evolve. Uh, we know the whole active passive debate and, and clearly flows, uh, you know, in, flows are going from active to passive products for, for many, many years now. That trend is not showing any signs of stopping. So I would say what, what it meant to be an active manager 20 years ago is different than what it means today. It's probably different than what it's going to mean 20 years from now. I, I think there will still be a place for active management, but it's all about what you will be doing. Um, you know, years ago, an active management role would could be essentially, you know, just owning the big names, trying to mimic, for the most part, what the benchmark is doing, and then taking little bets on the side to try and improve your performance, uh, uh, you know, or organically, just little little improvements. But that's not something that clients are willing to pay a premium for anymore. They're they're they can do passive products that seem to be performing just fine. So I would say, in general, active management um, will have to evolve to more concentrated. Uh, more, um, you know, focused, uh, deliberate bets that are truly active. You, you can't be passive active, quote unquote, anymore. Um, and so I think there you need to have a, a way of, of, of figuring that positioning out. How, how can you be truly active again? How can you make smaller or larger bets, make more, uh, you know, improve that the active share of the of the of the portfolio? Um, and so I think uh, the, the what, what, what's good about that is is there's no longer as much of an incentive to mimic benchmark performance. You now need a way to differentiate your process and your stock picking capabilities. And that means you need to have a toolkit that's going to help you identify 
the optimal places to be. And so I, I think it'll continue to evolve for sure. So when we think about that, I mean, because I've certainly seen with my own investing over time, focusing on being more concentrated, building the active share of my portfolio. Um, but we think about technical analysis and the underpinning of technical analysis is statistics. And sure. statistics tends to be the study of large amounts of data and large amounts of bets potentially so if you get more concentrated could that lead to the reduction in usefulness of technical analysis on your portfolio if you have to concentrate in more bet or less bets but bigger positions very good question and i would say that um <clears throat> yes and no um i would say that the way that a lot of institutions use technical analysis through more of a quantitative, more of a systematic process. Yes, there. You know, most quant models are are built on having a large amount of data, having a large sample size that you're you're using, having a large universe that you're working with, and owning large buckets of stocks. Right, you're owning like the top decile or top quintile of a list of hundreds of stocks as a way to get exposure to a certain factor. Having a more concentrated portfolio doesn't really allow you to do that. Um, but again, the technical toolkit wasn't necessarily designed as a portfolio level quantitative approach, even though that's that's one of the ways you can use it. It's also meant to drive buy and sell decisions on individual names. And that's where there's plenty of value as well. And so I think it's just a different way of applying the toolkit, thinking more tactically about positions, thinking about position sizing, thinking about exposure um, and, and, and using the charts as a way to inform um, those decisions. I, I would say it, it certainly is still still has a, a plenty of value. Um, you know, I, and I would say also, you know, when I say institutions are, quote unquote, using a certain thing, there are plenty of institutions, large institutions that have, I, I would guess, absolutely no technical inputs. There, there aren't many out there. And there are many, I think there are a great many closet technicians out there in the industry, um, from my own anecdotal experience. But um, there, are, there are plenty that don't use technical analysis or use charts as a primary input. Um, and so, you know, the idea that it would become more or less robust of a, of a performance based on usage, I think is, is, is not a huge issue only because I think there are plenty of people that have never looked at charts and certainly are not going to start anytime soon. So you're still dealing with a subset of the industry there. Gotcha. So when we think about what technical analysis is trying to help us do, you mentioned you're trying to harness or quantify investor behavior. So mm -hmm. Speaking less on the quantification piece and more qualitatively, what are the key investor behaviors that might prevent an investor from making good investment decisions? Oh, there's so many, Trey. Um, okay, well, how about we start with top I, three? Yeah, but, yeah so, sure. I, I think confirmation bias is the one that, that comes uh, to mind immediately. Confirmation bias is this idea that um, you know, you decide you're bullish. I'm bullish on the markets. And then you start gathering data. And any data that supports your bullish perspective, you sort of mentally give it greater weight. And anything that sort of uh, disputes your bullish outlook, you sort of mentally push it aside. And in the end, what's happened is all you've done is gathered evidence to support your preconceived opinion. And what you need to do, obviously, as an investor is completely flip that. You're buy or sell decision, your bullish or bearish outlook needs to happen at the end of your gathering of evidence, right? You gather all the evidence, um, you have an evidence-based approach looking at, uh, at what you think you see, what, you know, what, what, what uh, indicators, what uh, outlooks you, you think are important. And then you look at and decide, okay, based on what I'm seeing, this is, I think, the environment. This is, you know, the market overall is strong, the market overall is weak, and here's why. And then uh, you, you've done a better job at at, at drawing a conclusion based on the evidence, not making the conclusion and then trying to support it later on. That is one of the most fundamental uh, behavioral biases and, and everyone falls victim to it. And especially with stocks that you own, I own Home Depot, so therefore I really want it to go higher. And so I will start to find, I will look for news stories or, or earnings trends or, or an external analyst or anything that's gonna help me feel better about the fact that I own Home Depot as opposed to looking at the evidence and then to saying, here's what Home Depot looks like. Now, what's my position? All right, are those in agreement or not? Uh, and if you flip those, if you do the process first and then look at your positions, you're going to find 
you know, a lot of times they, they don't agree and you're, you're not positioned for what the evidence su- would suggest. So that is one, one of the most fundamental ones that I think everyone tends to fall, fall victim to. Um, the second one I would say would be uh, narrative bias. And, and narrative bias is the fact that uh, we love stories, right? We, um, there's a reason when something want, someone wants you to buy something, they tell you a story. They, give, they build a narrative for you, right? The car dealer is, is giving you a story about you owning this car and what's it going to be like so that you can you know, commit mentally to that narrative, that story. And when we're thinking of investing, we, we are hungry for narratives because there is so much information. There are so many things happening. The way we make sense of it as humans is to build a narrative about what's happening. The problem is when you become too tied to that narrative, you are now, um, you know, you are, you are, you are focused on that particular set of outcomes. And when things start to disagree with your narrative, it's difficult for you to adjust course based on what you're seeing then. Uh, and one of the common ways I've found narrative bias to, um, come into play is with, uh, uh, simple relationships, right? Stocks are doing well, which means gold should be underperforming because stocks are good. It's more of a risk on asset. So a risk off asset, a, a safe haven, like gold should do poorly. It's one of the simple conclusions we tend to make. However, I will show you plenty of times in market history where stocks have done well and gold has done well at the same time. Arguably, we're right at that same point right now when when stocks have been in a pretty good uptrend. Gold overall is still in, I would argue, a primary uptrend. And so you actually have a situation where they're both going to go up. There are other times when when they both go down. And there are plenty of times when they uh, when they uh, move in opposite directions. So correlations are not set in stone. They fluctuate greatly. But we build a simple narrative based on the price to gold relationship that will drive our conclusions instead of just continuing to review the evidence and seeing what's what it's actually playing. And remembering that the markets are not a simple mechanism. They're a complex system with tons of, of uh, potential drivers of asset prices on any given day, any given moment. And then the third one I would say, because you asked for three, would be the endowment effect which is essentially where stocks that you own, we talked about owning Home Depot earlier, it's a little different spin on that. Stocks that you own, you attribute greater value because they are yours, right? Your stocks are your babies, they're your kids, um, you, you feel emotionally connected to them. And so when the evidence starts to point against owning the stock that you have, Cheesecake Factory or whatever, you dig in your heels and you convince yourself that it's still okay to own it because you can't get rid of, uh, of something that's so important to you. And uh, Will Danoff, who was a uh, you know portfolio manager at Fidelity, used to say, uh, you know, think you don't you don't own stocks, you rent them. Uh, and again, that, that you know is not uh, related to uh, the um, responsibilities as a shareholder. You know, obviously you have responsibilities being an owner of the company. Totally fair. This is just mentally how you think of it. Think of it not as a position you own, but as a position you rent, and you should be willing to walk away from it when the conditions change and it's no longer a good uh, a good thing for you to own anymore. Um, and so a dominant effect is what prevents us from making a clear decision, getting out of something that's starting to not work. And I, again, in terms of technical analysis, that's where I found it adds so much value is looking at your current portfolio and finding when stocks you own are starting to underperform and doing it early enough that you can get out of the way and, and make sure that, uh, you know, prevent small losses from becoming larger losses. So you see, I mean, I think the best, the best argument that I've heard for technical analysis is that it can cut through that bias. I mean, is that what you agree with, is that you can basically cut through these types of biases by just saying <clears throat> it's very black and white, this is the price, it doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter if you own it, that sort of thing? That's exactly right. And and there's a reason why, like William O'Neill's methodology, the cancel methodology, there's a reason why there's a, a, a sort of set in stone 8% loss, right? So if a stock moves 8% against your position, it doesn't matter what you think, what you like, what the story is, you exit it. And that means you are limiting your losses to 8% or whatever percent that you decide on. Now, there are plenty of more sophisticated ways to try and manage potential capital loss, but but they're all trying to do that same thing that you alluded to. It's your, your emotions will create this situation where you want to continue to own something longer than you should, or when you want to take a shot at something when it's not really the right time. And technical analysis, I, I, I use the word discipline with my clients a lot. It, it adds discipline to your decision making process. So I literally when I've worked with financial advisors, um, thinking about asset allocation decisions, we literally will write out a checklist. Here is the checklist that you need to follow 
to earn the right to change your position. And, and it starts, you know, from a technical perspective, there are a list of things you would want to follow, but probably from a fundamental perspective, you could think of your own checklist for buying or selling a stock. What are the characteristics of a good company? And you need to answer those questions systematically because otherwise you will have an emotional connection to a certain idea. You will have this fear of missing out and you want to jump into it instead of following the discipline of, uh, of answering, of following a rigid process. And so charts, a lot of times, you know, one of my, my mentors called it the truth serum for the markets. It will tell you when your portfolio is underperforming and you need to take action. It is not an emotional decision. It is a fact. Your portfolio is suffering. Here's where you need to focus. So, I mean, when we think about these, I mean, a lot of these are very, I mean, like the endowment effect. They're, they're, it's hard to get over because <clears throat> you can talk about it and we can talk, oh, well, you need to avoid confirmation bias. You need to avoid narrative bias. You need to avoid the endowment effect. Um, if you fo- you know, if you allow these things to take control of you, then it can lead to worse investment performance. Mm, but yeah. I think a lot of times... Even if you know about it and you know, like, you know what confirmation bias is, you know what the endowment effect is, it doesn't make it easier. <laughs> Have you seen that? I mean, is, is this something where by simply by naming it, we can kind of solve the problem? Or is this more difficult than that to co- overcome these investor biases? That's such a great question. And I would, I would love to tell you that you know, having having become a, a somewhat of an expert in behavioral finance, teaching behavioral finance at the college level, working with institutional investors on some of these behavioral challenges, I would love to tell you that at some point you're not affected by them, but it's just not true. And I, you know, in my own investing, I still fall victim to some of these things, even though I, I know them very, very well. But it speaks to how hardwired they are in our brains as humans, right? We are wired a certain way for a lot of good reasons. Our, as humans, our investing lives, if you look at the history of humanity as a rounding error, it's the very last little bit built upon you know, centuries, if not millennia, of, of evolving as humans. And so we're not super, super well equipped to make emotionless investment decisions. That's just the reality of it. So I think awareness is a good start uh, to that part process, right? So naming confirmation bias, having an awareness of what it is, and, and being on the lookout for it. So trying to catch yourself when you're trying to, trying to go down that road, I think, is a good start. Um, for me, and that's where I've, I've used technical analysis as a toolkit, it's all about having a set of routines and a set of systems, building good habits that are going to minimize, they're not going to eliminate, but they're going to minimize the impact of those emotions. I'll, and I'll give you a good example. I always uh, tell people to think about their morning coffee routine. So what is, you get your cup of coffee, you fire up the computer, you are ready to start looking at the investment landscape. What do you start with? What is the very first thing that you do? <clears throat> and a lot of people will answer I turn on financial media like TV or something. Um, I look at my portfolio. I look at, you know, Asian markets, what's happened overnight. And I would say if you're a long-term investor, all three of those things are the wrong answer because what you are doing is you are orienting yourself to the short term. And one of the worst uh, fumbles you can make as a long-term investor is to make long-term decisions based on short-term data. You need to be looking at the long-term trends and, and understanding that part of the equation. So the first thing I look at every morning that is financial related is a seven-year weekly chart of the S&P 500. It's going back to 2012, and it's showing me the long-term trend of the S&P 500. And I do that every morning. And the reason is because I'm a long-term investor, and I better be starting with what the long-term trend is. So the long-term trend on U.S. stocks is positive. And that's not a judgment call or a, a, a subjective opinion. That is an objective look at the data. The, the market continues to make higher highs and higher lows. Charles Dow's definition from the early 1900s of an uptrend, the markets were in an uptrend. So everything I look at from that moment on should come from the starting point. I'm priming myself that the long-term trend has been positive. And from there, I then can start to fill in questions about what's causing that performance. Am I getting any indication that there's an inflection point nearby? And what would I be looking for? I can then at the very end of the process, look at my own portfolio, look at my client's portfolio, um, turn on the financial media to see what's happening minute to minute. But a lot of times, if you're starting your day with that minute to minute, the flickering ticks of the market, you're orienting yourself to short-term fluctuations, and then you have a lot much a much much bigger hurdle to orient yourself to the proper long-term uh, horizon that you're trying to to win on. So you know that's just an example of where I think having a proper routine to how you're consuming information can have dramatic effects on your ability 
to minimize the impact of some of these biases. So I want to I want to come back to kind of investor habits that lead to success. But before that, mm. let's discuss what you mean. We've, we've proposed basically this idea that these biases, these um, tendencies to have emotional investment decisions can lead to mistakes. And if you take mm. that to its logical conclusion, then the next obvious question is, should investors be human at all? Like, should we only be <laughs> investing with AI? I mean, basically, right. if, if all of these things are problems and that you, even if you're aware of them, you can't fully eliminate that. Well, then the only way to eliminate it is to take humans out of the equation and just let the computers, you know, basically trade with each other. So right. the question is, do you think that's the logical conclusion? You know, we could argue, well, we don't have the tech today, but is that the logical conclusion 50 years from now? Or does the presence of the human emotion in the decision, even if it's minimized, actually lead to investment, positive investment performance somewhere? So like where can our emotions help us? Or or are we just doomed to be replaced by machines, even in the investment <laughs> industry? I mean, it, it, really good, you mean good, for good, those good, that are on the younger good, side, good. like myself, that that really affects. You know, is, is this a, is this a place to consider in the future, or or I really need to be going elsewhere? <laughs> right. So I, I mean, and I would relate it to. I mean, there 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 are plenty of ways where technology has certainly affected industries, and, and finance is no different. There have been plenty of changes. I would relate, you know, the role of the active investor. I would re relate it to, uh, you know, bank tellers, right? So years ago, ATMs come out, and everyone is talking about how. Bank tellers are all going to disappear because why would you need a bank teller? Well, if you've gone, what's funny is even with all the computing power we have, there are probably more bank branches now than ever before. And if you look, there are still people gainfully employed as bank tellers in the, in the, in the branches. If you ask them what their role is now versus what it was 20 years ago, the role has changed a great deal, right? So it used to be very transactional. You would be, you know, uh, cashing checks and you'd be making deposits and be doing different things. Now it's more consultative. You are, you know, computers can handle the basic stuff. You just need twenty dollars out of your account. You can go to the ATM. But if you actually need to wire money to a bank in Italy, or you know, thought think about how you're positioned in a certain uh, CD, you need to talk to somebody. And so the role of the teller has evolved to address where computers are not able to to handle it, or where people are not really interested in offloading or outsourcing what they're doing to a computer. So. I would say the, the financial industry will still be thriving decades from now. I just think the roles are going to change. Um, and so you, you asked in particular, what, 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 where does this leave humans? I would say three things that come to mind. I'm, I'm jotting down as you're talking. I would say one is uh, creativity, right? So the ability of humans to think creatively, to look for patterns, to look for relationships. We are so much better suited than a computer is to do that. Now with AI, with machine learning, um, that's you know they, they're we are trying to train computers to do that, uh, and and I you know I've always told people with machine learning, you know a, a, a without using without using machine learning, you're sort of uh, you know taking the recipe and teaching the computer a recipe. You're 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 giving it a quant model, and then it starts giving you the results, starts baking the cake every day. Machine learning is instead of giving the the computer the recipe, you're giving them the ingredients. And letting the computer come up with a recipe and refine the recipe over time and still make good cakes that, that you're kind of surprised by. But there still takes a human to figure out what the ingredients are and figure out how to tweak the model. And what's happening is as a lot of models are left on their own, they start coming up with really crazy results, right? So, um, you know, I found examples in, in research where uh, computers are given so many different ingredients thinking, great, now they have everything. And what happens is they end up getting so overwhelmed with it, you come down with just a super simplistic model because that's what works better than all the, the crazy bells and whistles of all the different uh, all the different data. So I would say the models are only as good as what the computer is given. And there we are nowhere near the fact where, can, where people are not a really crucial, if not the most important part of that process. Um, I would say the second thing is emotions are not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you don't want to trade like a robot because I think we're missing what makes us human. Um, besides the creativity, I think your emotional state um, can be helpful. And and I, I would say a lot of investors, you have sort of your sixth sense, your spidey sense when something doesn't feel right. And I think as investors, um, we get that sense. We feel that something is, is happening. We feel that something doesn't look right. Something doesn't feel right. And what you don't want to do is use that as your complete process. That is not your process. 
that is what should tell you to revisit the data, revisit the information, um, you know, dig deeper into some of the stories. If something doesn't feel right, there might be a signal there in the fact that you're able to send something you can't quite put your finger on yet, but you know something's not right. And the best investors I've worked with use that to their, uh, you know, to their benefit, and they dig deeper into a story that doesn't feel right. And a lot of times that's when you catch when the, you know, it's just not the right time or, or the story isn't as complete as you thought, or you just need to wait for some other, other things to happen. But using it as an indicator to dig deeper, I think can be, can be very helpful. And then the third thing, I think across the industry, one thing that humans are very well equipped for is empathy, which is putting yourself into other people's shoes and a computer, you know, when you, you know, hopefully never happens, but let's say you get very sick and you uh, get cancer, you're not going to want to sit down with a computer and have it tell you you have cancer and you're going to die at at an X amount of time, you're going to want to sit down with a human who tells you, listen, here's the situation. I've seen it before. Here's what's going to happen. It's okay. Do you have any questions? And there's a reason why that relationship will continue in medicine for years and years. And I think the same thing happens in, in finance. Most people are very poorly equipped to manage their own finances and they need expertise from people who aren't just good at analyzing the markets, but are good at communicating that in layman's terms to people that are confused and nervous and excited and euphoric and desperate and being able to put yourself in there in a client's shoes and have a meaningful conversation with them is not going to go away either. So hopefully those are three things. Humans aren't going anywhere. I think the role just has to, has to evolve as, as we've evolved uh, in the last 20, 30 years as well. So as the role evolves, um, not to go too deep on it, but do you, do you see this trend of decreasing management fees continuing? And I mean, and how, I mean, as the role evolves, I mean, it's basically, it's, it's recognizing that the role has changed, the fees are changing. I mean, does that fee reach a stopping point where, where active management is still given a premium, but maybe instead of the premium being two and 20, it's now half a percent or a quarter. I mean, what, do you think yeah. there's an end point here that we reach where it levels back off again? Um, I mean, it, it's it, it's certainly hard to say. I mean, the trend has been shrinking fees, and that's happened for a long time. And I, you know, I started in June of 2000, so that was just when decimalization was happening. Happening as you know, the buy sell spread starts to shrink, but it was still pretty healthy there. Now it's you know, sub penny, if not more, um, you know, difference between the the bid and the offer. So I, I mean that. That has happened, and that that is a, a an unstoppable train that is moving in that direction. Um, all sorts of management fees have shrunk and either gone away or are minimal now, uh, and and that certainly seems to be continuing. Uh, so again, but I think there are there are plenty of places where you add value and where people are willing to pay for it. I think just the difference is what they're willing to pay for and how they think of it. So again, if I'm just getting started in the industry, I and, you know for me, I've focused on an area of the industry, which is investor behavior, where I feel like people are pretty poorly equipped on their own to make good decisions without some help. And I've tried to be in roles and build my own businesses that help that help people manage that. And I would encourage people to be looking for opportunities like that. Um, having said that, there are plenty of opportunities on more quantitative ways that that's not how my brain works, but there are plenty of people that, have, that are going to build fantastic careers thinking more about how to automate and how to, uh, you know, capture some of the great opportunities to outperform and quantify them in a repeatable way. Um, you know, re- reading Jim Simon's recent book about about that is a great illustration of how he was able to do that. And I think there are plenty of opportunities to continue to, continue to do that. I would just, as always, be focusing on where the industry is headed and not where it's where it's been. And, and I think you're you're there will there will always be plenty of places for good people and 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 uh, and well equipped people. And there will always be people willing to pay for the right things it's just it's it's figuring out what that what that thing is that makes sense so let's shift to investor habits as i had said so we let's really focus on you know what are the investor habits that lead to success we've talked about some of the things that investors struggle with but to leave our audience on a discussion of what can they do to harness some of the mental models we've discussed some ones that we haven't what should they be doing in their investment process their research you know, what are the daily things or the weekly things that will make them a better investor over the long term? Absolutely. I, I, and there are, there are a number of ways to answer that. I, I would say first off is keeping a, a journal. And I would say I would say two things about that. Number one, <clears throat> I'm, I've, uh, I read a book 
uh, a, n- a number of years ago called The Artist's Way. Uh, it's actually The Artist's Way at Work and, uh, and basically talks about creativity as a way to unleash creativity in the workplace and, and in your job and, and think outside the box, which I would argue if you're entering finance, you really need to be, to be doing that if you, if you want to um, be a part of where the industry is headed. Uh, and so part of there, you know, the very first thing you do, the first week your exercise is to write three pages in a journal every day. And it can just be anything. And I, I would find part of getting ahead of some of these behavioral biases is having an open and honest conversation with yourself about your imperfections as an investor and having a better awareness of a self-awareness of what's driving your decisions. And you can't do that unless you can get inside your head pretty well. And I have found over many years of doing that every day, it is an incredibly valuable process. And at the beginning, it will be super uncomfortable and you will want, you will be writing out, why am I doing this? But what happens is over time, some really amazing insights will start to appear on those pages you're writing. And that's the way you really start to understand how your own brain works. And for me, it helped me get inside my own head as an investor and think about where I was uh, not setting myself up for success. So I, I think that's a really important uh, thing for anyone to do, not just investors. The second one is keeping a good trading journal or a good investment journal. So keeping a good record of what decisions you're making and why. There are plenty of ways to do that. And I've had some clients that are old school. They keep a notebook and they write down every trade they make and why and what evidence they use to drive that decision. I have some that use Excel uh, pretty well, which is great because you can capture that and and, uh, and and look at it over time. Um, I've had some people that just write a blog and start a blog that they never share with anyone, but it's just a way of journaling what they're seeing and what they're thinking. Um, also, you know, guys that are more technically oriented, I've had them put notations directly on the charts, which if you're a chart user, that's the way to do it is, is use the charts as a notebook and actually capture your thinking right on the place that you're making your decisions. So having that trading journal, that investment journal is not the end point. That's a really good starting point. The, the point I would suggest to you is have a what I'd call a postmortem analysis. And if you've ever done anything with the technology group, they will often do a postmortem meeting at the end of a big project. And that's Latin for after death. It's sort of at the end of this project. Let's take a look back, evaluate how things went, what went well, what went poorly, how can we improve the process for the next time? And as investors, we we love to mentally move past some of our best learning experiences because they, they're painful. And as an investor, the best thing you can do is look back at some of your poor decisions or decisions that did not work out well and see what actually drove those decisions and, and what you can improve on. Uh, one of my favorite meetings when I was managing professional analysts, we called it the, the worst call meeting. And a couple times a year, we'd all get in a room together and you had to bring a printout of your worst call. What stock did you just completely mess up on? And it was great because, number one, you saw that everyone had a worst call. Even guys that were really getting it done, they still had some bad calls along the way. But it was a great learning process because you had to admit to other people, here's what I did. Here's why I made the decision. And here's what I missed. And and a lot of times you will find, you know, you'll be able to understand, is it there is a gap in your process? Or is there some evidence that would have caused you to make a different decision? And it just wasn't something that you included. And, and should you start incorporating that? Um, but but at the end of it, you know, what did you learn? What are you gonna what are you gonna do differently tomorrow? And having a regular period where you look back at some of your decisions and evaluate, especially some of the ones that didn't go well, I think is really important. Especially now leading into the end of the year, which is a nat- natural time to take a step back, look at where you've come from, where you're gonna go. It's a really good time to dig out a trading journal and review some of those uh, some of those decisions that didn't pan out. Now that those are some great ones. I mean, I think the uh the blog, I mean, the the journals definitely make a huge difference. You know, coincidentally, I'm yeah. doing most of these myself. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, like I have an Trey, investment. you come across as a very thoughtful investor. I am not surprised. Oh, well, no, I have an investment journal. It's this uh, It's this podcast and blog we're talking about. And, of course, you know, <laughs> n- no one listens to it, so I haven't shared it with anybody. But, <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, well, no, and it's funny. If you, if you think of some of the, you know, the bloggers that were early on in that, you know, sort of financial – uh, blogging type of thing. They all talk about how important it was in their process. The idea of having to write something and just and being forced to articulate what they were seeing and what they were hearing. It it ended up being an, an integral part of what they do. And you know now at at stockcharts.com, I actually host our closing bell show on Stockcharts TV every day. And preparing for that show and having to have a dis- disciplined process of understanding how the markets have changed and what that should mean for investors has been a fantastic growth experience for for myself. So it sounds like you found the same with the, with a podcast. I'm not surprised. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, the advice I give everyone is to start a blog, 
with, I mean, you don't, mm-hmm. ha- with always saying that you just basically to do the investment journal, just write what you're yeah. doing, write down, you know, what you're buying, why you can make it private, you can make it public, whatever, but it, it's a good way <clears throat> of documenting your thoughts. Cause what I've found, and I assume it's similar for you is that by writing it down, especially if you write it before you buy, you might not actually buy the stock because <laughs> when you writing is hard. I mean, certainly anyone who's actually written a decent amount, whether for a living or just for fun, writing is hard. So when you write something down, you have to order your thoughts. You have to get them oriented right. And when you write it down and I like the blog because you put it out in public, um, it forces you to recognize where your shortcomings are. Um, Absolutely. And, and I would say, and maybe to add a third, uh, a third idea, I think, you know, finding a tribe, finding a community of people that you can stay accountable to is really helpful. Um, you know, my, my, my business here, Alpha Research, really has ended up becoming more, more and more consulting for financial advisors. And, and I, my favorite call with a new client is that first conversation where I ask them to just describe some of their processes and, and their routines. And how do, you, how do you pick a stock? Walk me through an example recently of what you did. And it, you can you can just hear in someone's voice as they start describing what they did. You it becomes very real when you have to justify to someone else what you did and why. And just that simple process, I feel like it's I'm, I'm almost a personal trainer for an investor, where it's just a process of staying accountable and having to justify. Yeah, here's the decision I made, and here's why. It makes it very real, and it forces you to stay true to to that process. So, so yeah, finding some way to be accountable, whether it's writing, working with someone, uh, having a, a tribe, a community is, is really, really helpful, especially w- early on. Yeah. I mean, especially those postmortems. I mean, I did a postmortem on this podcast in my episode 30 for anyone listening, wants to listen back to it. It was my GameStop investment, which was a complete failure, but, um, <laughs> But but it was interesting because that was the first episode where someone actually reached out and said, "Hey, you know, this is this is good work because it's mm-hmm. those sorts of things where you really dive into your failures and you see, well, why did I fail? That you really start to improve. And I think for That's that right. tribe, I mean, for anyone who's not on Twitter that is interested in investing, you got to get on financial Twitter because there's some great people you can learn from. Um, and it's not just holding it. I mean. There's a lot of people that are better than you that can that can have more experience that can learn and teach you. Just like I'm getting to learn and be taught today by hosting this podcast, um, and so I think that's that's important for people to get out there and to to grow, um, because investing, no one, someone's already done it before, right? And we just need to to recognize that. So I think I always tell people there there are plenty of it's great to learn lessons when there are less zeros involved in your decision, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, don't don't lose the money yourself if you can't. I mean, certainly <laughs> I don't think there's any way to become a good investor without losing money at yeah. some point. I mean, you're going every, to struggle. Every great investor has a story of of loss and what they learn from it and and I people often say that's the the tuition, that's the tuition you pay for yes. becoming a, a great investor and and every anyone you ask will have that that example of a of a miss and and yeah, you you have to have your own at some point for sure. Yeah, and I think if you're if you're listening if you haven't had a loss, don't worry, it's coming. So, just be <laughs> just be ready. Um so I think, you know, just to kind of wrap things up a bit, you know, what would you say is the number one thing that you think that an institutional investor could do to improve their process? And the number one thing you think a retail investor can do to improve their process? It can be something that we've already talked about, but just, you know, what do you want to leave people on to really understand going forward as a takeaway? Oh yeah, great question. I, I mean, I would say for an institutional investor, I would I would be thinking about where uh, you know. Again, we we all face these challenges with making good decisions, and and again, I've worked with enough institutional money managers to know we're not immune to to those influences. Uh, you have the ability to surround yourself with you know good information and good people to help you make good decisions. Hopefully, so I would be I would be I would I would challenge you to be thoughtful about where technical analysis could, could serve a role. And I, and I would, I found people tend to use one of those two that we talked about earlier, um, pretty well and, and one that they could improve on, um, you know, whether it's a, you know, a way to filter stocks to the, the, the types of names that are doing pretty well and, and, and find, you know, understanding the market environment 
having it be in, at, the be at the beginning of your process, or whether it's a way to manage risk and identify when some of your positions aren't working and, and forcing you to revisit them from a fundamental perspective. Um, I think there, those are two really ap good applications. And there, there is signal in the charts that, and that's been demonstrated. Um, I think if you're, if you're not paying attention to those inputs, you're just, you're, you're shortchanging yourself in terms of your ability to, you know, get in and out at, at appropriate time. So that's what I would say for an institutional investor. Um, for a retail investor, I would say, think a lot about your routines and, and, and a lot of the, the work I do with, uh, individuals is just, is coaching in terms of, uh, what routines you make, how you, I think as, especially when you're early on, there's a fire hose of information about there out there and you can just be overwhelmed with the amount of people putting ideas out. And so I would, I would limit it to some thoughtful people that are really going to help you grow as an investor. Um, but really think about what your routine is, how you're going to spend your day or your week as an investor. What's the thing that you do every morning? How do you start your day as an investor over the weekend on a Sunday afternoon? What could you do when the markets are closed to sort of reflect on how things have, uh, have gone? And if you think about those routines, improving those routines, I would argue, is what's going to help get you to a point where you're really successful over time is, is by having a good process that you improve on over time. But, but it's got to start with some good routines. Well, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Can you just take a minute to, to promote your stuff, where people can find more information about you, where you'd like them to, to touch base and connect with you? Yeah, thanks again, Trey. I, really thoughtful questions. I'm really impressed by what you've done with the show, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be on with you. I, I enjoyed this a great deal. I hope, I hope everyone listening did as well. Um, yeah, if, if this sort of thinking about your decision making and uh, your, your mental processes and, and behavioral biases is of interest, uh, a couple of things you can do. One is my, my website's called marketmisbehavior.com. And I have a blog, I have a YouTube channel that's fed through the, the website as well. So you can uh, get some uh, you know, posts and, and uh, ideas about how you can improve your routines, develop better habits. And then you mentioned on, on Twitter, I, I think it's such a great community uh, on there of, uh, of people looking at the markets and, and sharing some of their insights. So at D Keller CMT is the way to uh, get a hold of me. They give me a follow there and I'll look forward to chatting with you then. Well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll be sure to link and include those all in the podcast show notes for anyone listening. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the DIY investing podcast. Please visit our website and subscribe to our email list at DIYinvesting.org for guides, videos, and resources to help make you a better investor. The DIY Investing Podcast is presented for general informational and entertainment purposes only. I have not considered your specific situation or risk profile, and I have not provided investment advice. The information presented on the DIY Investing Podcast should not be construed as investment advice. The views and opinions expressed on the DIY Investing Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's host or sponsors. DIY Investing, its producers, sponsors, and host, Trey Henniger, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based upon information or viewpoints presented on the DIY Investing Podcast.